Hello! Welcome to another exciting reading review. April was not only the best reading month of my entire life, but also the most bountiful. I read 18 books. Don't ask me how. I never know if it's a sign that my life is going well when I read that much, or if it's a sign that she's anything but. Um, whatever it means, we're gonna talk about them all today. <laughs> but first, let's hear from today's sponsor, Book of the Month! If you or anyone you know has ever struggled with not knowing what to read next, then Book of the Month is a subscription service for you. It's a super popular and fast-growing online book service for readers just like me, and just like you, I say please assume. What they do is promote new and emerging authors to help readers find books that they're bound to love. Their team works night and day, sifting through hundreds of titles to give us a monthly curated selection of new and early release books. So this means you can spend more time reading and less time researching what to read next. But my personal favorite part of Book of the Month is that it's risk-free, meaning that you can push pause on any month for any reason whatsoever without being charged or penalized. As long as you have a US-based shipping address, you can get your first book from Book of the Month for $9.99 using the code Allison Pages. There are six completely different books you get to choose from this month, as well as a new add-on. Let's talk about them. Breathless by Amy McCullough is the thriller mountaineering expedition gone very wrong. The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas is a gothic haunted fiction. Party of Roll by Abby Jimenez is an unlikely small town romance. Darling Girl by Liz Mikowski is a fantasy Peter Pan retelling. This gorgeous historical fiction, Take My Hand by Dolan Perkins Valdez. Book of Night by Holly Black, which is something you can add on to your Book of the Month box, which has been compared to Neil Gaiman, which is one of my favorite authors. But I saved the best for last because look what came in my Book of the Month box. Your Bebueta by Nina LaCour. As some of you may know, no, Watch Over Me is one of my favorite books of all time. It sits on my favorite shelf. And this is Nina LaCour's first adult book. It's gay. I'm so excited. It doesn't come out in Europe until like June. So, ha <laughs> ha I'm scheming. Yerba Buena is a propulsive journey through the lives of two women trying to find somewhere or someone to call home. Look at the cover. Oh my God. I'm so excited. I'll definitely be reading this this month. So if you pick this one, we're going to be reading it together. Please let me know which book you would hypothetically pick or make your dreams come true. And click the link in the description box below to get your first book for Book of the Month for $9.99 using the code Allison Pages. Ooh, it's a good month this one. On with the video. All right, we've got a lot to talk about. Let's get started. The first book I read last month was True Viz by Sarah Novick. This is a multi-perspective literary contemporary that follows the lives of a couple of students at the River Valley School for the Deaf, as well as their principal. It is a fictional story with fictional characters, but there is so much to learn within these pages. Occasionally, in between the chapters, there will be facts and images to help the reader understand more about American Sign Language. Not only were the characters very compelling and realistic, and the story sweet and simple enough to follow, but it's intersectional as well. Personally, I I had no idea that Black American Sign Language A existed or B was a completely different form and of course discriminated form of sign language. But it makes complete sense seeing as if schools were segregated in the United States for as long as they were, this will extend to deaf schools as well. This book made me tear up, this book made me giggle. Honestly my only complaint with it was that I thought that the ending was a little bit rushed. But aside from that, I think that this should be required reading in school. And it's the kind of book that was so good it helped me ignore or not care about the flaws within it. So she got five stars. Next! Pure Color by Shayla Hetty. I went into this book knowing almost nothing and I think that you should do the same. I bought it off of one sentence alone and that was that the main character gets lost in a leaf. Need I say more? It is a little bit confusing. It's a lot of it confusing. It's even more so weird. There was just something about the writing of this one that had me waking up the next day thinking about it. Part of me thinks that this requires some serious big brain energy but then at the same time we're addressing very complex and existential questions in a very direct and non-complex way. If you liked Pew by Catherine Lacey I would recommend this one. If you are somebody that needs to walk away from books having all your questions answered, I would not recommend this one. It was so strange, but it was so good. At first I thought she was a four star read because there was a little bit too much God in there, but I woke up the next morning with nothing else on my mind, but craving more from this author, craving more of this voice. It's so unique. So good in fact that the day after reading it, I bought another book from Sheila. Five stars, five stars, five stars. Two five stars in a row? This never happens. But wait, I was not kidding when I said this was the best reading month of my life. She found her first five star romance. As some of you know, I've been trying to thaw the bitter ice cold ball in my soul that prevented me from liking romance. My issues with it typically include that characters aren't complete people, we don't know what their interests are, we don't know how they spend their days, we don't know their family or their friends or anything other than the fact that they're pining for this person and that there's just so much miscommunication that it is endlessly frustrating. And with those two things, I can't care about the spicy scenes because who are they? I found a book that solved all those problems for me. I couldn't recommend it more. Dating Dr. Dill by Nisha Sharma. I'm gonna be honest, I had little interest in picking 
picking up this book because the cover looks like an overpriced Pinterest portrait. Don't let that dissuade you. Oh my gosh. This book follows a man and a woman, both from Indian families. Karina believes in love marriage, whereas Prem has little emphasis on feelings and more emphasis on compatibility and arranged marriages. It's both enemies to lovers and fake dating, but this book was so complete. We get a glimpse into both of their lives outside of each other. We understand their family, their friends are also complete characters, they have interests, they have hobbies, the culture is bountiful, there's all this great descriptions of food, there were clear stakes outside of the relationship that tied into the relationship, as opposed to other romance books I've read where the only stake is man doesn't think he's ready for feelings yet. I just loved this through and through. I went from having no interest in reading it, having a TikTok persuade me to pick it up, and then reading it in one setting. And since all of it was so good, the spice was great. I had a great time through and through. I loved it so much. It made me feel so happy and good. She's starting to like romance. This is character growth. I'm feeling amazing. Of course she got five stars. Of course she did. <laughs> Next, Stolen Tongues by Felix Blackwell. It's about a couple who goes to a cabin in the woods in the middle of the snow, and the woman is known for sleepwalking and mumbling in her sleep, but ever since going to this cabin, she's now whispering to creepy things outside. The first chapter of it was so good. I read it before bed and stopped because I knew I needed to read it in the daytime and also early enough on in the day that I can recover before bedtime. Definitely the scariest book I've ever read, but the entire story is based around Native American folklore. He has a whole afterward explaining that he worked with indigenous people and that he did his research, he did his homework, unlike TJ Klune or Hani Yanagaha. But I don't think it's my place to give him a pass. I don't think it's my place to decide if this is properly done, well done, well handled. There is a world of difference between me telling a friend in passing that this is the scariest book I've ever read and knowing that they're never going to pick it up as opposed to thousands of people watching this video with intentions to read the books that I recommend. So I don't know if I would recommend this one, but if you have any paranormal horror recommendations, please let me know because I would love to find a story that scares me as much as this but doesn't take its story material from oppressed groups. You know what I mean? Next, Unwell Women, A Journey Through Medicine and Myth in a Man-Made World by Eleanor Cleghorn. Once upon a time, I did not feel comfortable identifying as a feminist because I saw a lot of extremist, turfy energy, non-intersectional, extremely white feminist voices branding themselves as feminism. And I thought that if that's what feminism is, I don't want to be a part of that. Obviously, I understand now that that's not the case. Thank goodness. But this book was an extremely challenging but important reminder of what feminism is and why we need it. This is a nonfiction that covers how male-centered the medical world is and how it has been that way throughout history and how little change we have made, how little progress we've made over literal centuries, how the whole hysterical woman stereotype still exists today. On one hand, I thought this book was really strong in the sense of telling real stories of real women. It's not just throwing dry facts at you, but that also made it so difficult to read. It was interesting enough that I could feel myself wanting to read more and more of it per sitting, but it was so emotionally draining and painful that I could only read a couple of chapters at a time. Another book that I think should be required reading in high school or at least college, I gave this one four stars. I definitely recommend it. Take care of yourself with this one. Take your time with this one. It's a lot. What's that I hear? Western music. Hey, do you like cats? Do you like my cats? Then ye and ha on over to my Everpress shop. Link down below to get your very own Cowboy Cats crew net. 10% of the proceeds go to Cats for Adoption Kiev. Limited time only. Pre-orders end soon. Don't miss out. Thanks for chatting, partner. Anyway, you might be thinking to yourself, ah, oh, Allie, you've had such a great reading month. Was anything under four stars? Yup. The Discomfort of Evening by Marika Lucas Reineveld. Ugh. You follow the story through the eyes of a 10 year old girl from the Netherlands and her oldest brother died and it's meant to show what unravels and takes place in the family after this event. Um, but it was mostly just overly graphic and unnecessary scenes surrounding children's genitals and I hated it. In the first scene you can think, ah, uh, the author's trying to be raw and real, children are curious about all kinds of things, she's trying to include it all, but by the fourth scene, why are we here? Why are we doing this? What is this serving to the story? Why? I DNF'd it with like 80 pages left to go because I just couldn't fucking take it anymore. And I swear to God, if someone comments, That's the point. It's subverting expectations. Shut the fuck up. Could not unrecommend this more. Do not read this. Do not buy this. No, 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 no. So yeah, DNF'd it. Very aggressively DNF'd it. If you have any better recommendations from Dutch authors, would love to hear them because this is the only Dutch book I've read and it did not leave the best taste in my house. Next, let's talk about the two books that I read when I traded lives with Sally Tim. There's a whole reading vlog on both of these, so if you want more reactions, more feelings, they're there. Let's start with the bad and end on a high, shall we? Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. So this book is a classic 
anti-war, technically sci-fi, shorter fictional story. I couldn't tell you much more about it because after reading it, I had to spark notes what happened. I don't know what it is. It's definitely me, I think. <laughs> this just felt like something you're assigned for school. It felt like homework. I had no idea what was happening. I read the whole thing and didn't know what I just read and not like in a good pure color kind of way, just in a, what was that? Kind of way. When I read a book, a movie plays in my brain, and there was something about the way this was written that really fucked up the film reel. It was black the whole time. However, I didn't give it a one star. I gave it a two because I can respect what it did, apparently. You know, it's really well known for telling people war is bad, and that's good, I guess. <laughs> but I didn't like it. Two stars. But then I read The Little Prince by, and we'll let Lawrence handle this one. Antoine de Saint Exupéry. This is about a little prince who goes on a little adventure, meeting various different characters, animals, people, and essentially coming to the conclusion that, wow, people on Earth sure have their priorities not right. Why are adults so stressed making up their silly little stresses, making up their own problems? It's not that serious. My favorite character was the fox. I loved what they had to say. Such wisdom, such insight. I just thought this was such a powerful but simple short read. It's a classic that I can get behind. It's a book that I'll definitely want to reread in the future. This is right up my alley. This is exactly what I look for in a book, and that's why it sits on my favorite shelf. Woohoo! Five stars! Obviously. Next, Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ang. We read this in April for the Pocket Pages Book Club. It's linked down below. It's through the Patreon. It's one buck a month. You can come and go whenever you want. We read a book within the first three weeks of a month and then discuss on Discord in a temporary chat in the last week of the month. So you don't have to be available for any live streams or anything like that. There's no way of missing out on the discussion. Join us if you want. We're reading The Five Wounds this month. It's so good so far. Anyway, Little Fires Everywhere. First Celeste Ang book I've ever read, which feels like a crime being on book two. Very confusing feeling. I did not understand the hype and actually hated the first 160, 170 pages. Almost half of the book. I didn't care about the rich family. I didn't feel like I needed or benefited at all from these extensive backstories from all these rich teenagers. I just couldn't care less. The synopsis says that a baby gets adopted and that divides the neighborhood as far as how they feel about said adoption. And that really only exists in the last half of the book, which felt like a completely different book. If it weren't for the book club, I would have DNF'd this one, which definitely influenced how I rated the book as a whole because I thought that the section about adoption was so strongly written, had great metaphors, perfectly outlined moral ambiguity, really tore me in a bunch of different directions on how to feel and what to think. That part to me was so strong, but the first half of the book was so boring and drawn out that I couldn't rate it any higher than a three, to be honest. If I would have DNF'd it otherwise, it can't get anything higher than that, in my opinion. So I absolutely loved the second half of the book. I thought it was worth pushing through, but I totally understand if you weren't able to. Next, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them by Jason Stanley. This book is exactly what it sounds like. It's a nonfiction about fascism, what tool people use to implement it and keep it strong. I thought that this book was so well written. I was underlining and dogging so many things. I think it's very clear and accessible. The pillars of fascism are very obviously stated. Anti-intellectualism, creating a mythical past that you want to bring back to the current day, reinforcing a hierarchy, which then reinforces a false sense of victimhood. A heavy emphasis on law and order politics, which really keeps alive the us versus them, and is usually alive and well in propaganda, and more. But my personal favorite section of the book that made so much click to me, because I see so often these discourses online, and I can't wrap my head around how they are so non-productive. I'm just so shocked at how vastly different the stances are. And it's not just that they're not on the same page, it's like they're reading completely different books. Do you know what I mean? He says, disagreement requires a shared set of presuppositions about the world. Even dueling requires agreement about the rules. I know I've said this a couple times in this video, but this is the book that needs to be required reading in high school. I gave this one four stars and I know I said it a few times already, but out of all the ones I've mentioned, this is the book that needs to be required reading. Uh, but it won't because we're banning books now. Next, The Keeper of the Night by Kylie Lee Baker. This is a YA fantasy that follows a girl who is half British Reaper and half Japanese Shinigami. And in the very beginning of the book, she does something unforgivable and decides to flee the UK to find her mom in Japan. But she has a very close connection to her half brother who doesn't want her to go alone, so they go on this adventure together. I think the biggest strength of this book was Baker's ability to beautifully and also straightforwardly present the theme of being a mix of two places, having two cultural identities exist in one person at the same time. Being too Japanese to be British, being too British to be Japanese, and not ever feeling like you belong in one exact place it was so well represented in these pages. What I think fell a little flat were the characters. I thought that we had such a great opportunity to solidify a strong sibling bond between Nevin and Ren, and I just never really bought it. And I think the reason for this was that the pacing was very strange within this one. Before we understand the world or even who the characters are, we're immediately thrown into the conflict of the book, which just kind of made the rest of it feel a little bit off. I did think it was still a really great adventure. I thought that the ending was pretty explosive, but overall I just wanted more from this book. So she landed right in the middle of the three for 
for me. But it's still quite good. If it interests you, definitely pick it up. Next, The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. So this is about a girl who goes to visit her brother in Paris, but when she arrives, he's not in his apartment like he promised he would be. So she breaks in and stays and tries to piece together all the clues of his disappearance. The back says, everyone's a neighbor, everyone's a suspect, and everyone knows something they're not telling. So it was a pretty fun whodunit. I thought the beginning was strong and the end was strong. The middle got a little monotonous, a little repetitive, but I cared through and through, that's for sure. And I definitely had a lot of fun putting the pieces together. For the most part, this is exactly what I look for in my thrillers. I gave her three and a half stars. I definitely want to pick up The Hunting Party and or The Guest List by Lucy Foley next. Did you rate either of those? Which one was your favorite? She's fun. Next, Time as a Mother by Ocean Vuong. This is Ocean Vuong's second poetry collection. I have his fiction book, Honor for Beautifully Gorgeous, on my favorite shelf, so he is an autobi author for me. I'm not the biggest, brainiest, poetryist gal. I'm gonna be honest. I don't understand a lot of poetry. It's not one of my favorite genres, but he just has such a way with words that I'll never not read everything he puts out. Even if I don't understand it, I can feel the beauty of each word on the page. My favorite poems of his are the ones that just kind of seem like off-the-cuff ramblings. I loved Beautiful Short Loser, and I also loved Reasons for Staying. Oh, Reasons for Staying was damn good. The line, do you know how many hours I've wasted watching straight boys play video games? I'm not sad, he told me once laughing. I'm just always here. Ugh, for as long as I can remember, I've had a preference for mediocre bodies, including this one. Ugh. So every time I would feel myself getting lost, I would get pulled in with another line like that. I don't rate poetry, because I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, but I had a really good time with this one. If you like poetry, definitely pick this one up. If you like fiction that has beautiful prose, definitely read on Arthur Briefly Gorgeous. Couldn't recommend it enough. Up next, I read the entire Heart Suffered by Alice Oseman. Y'all, I know you've heard it ad nauseum, but the series is so cute. It's so well done. I had assumed that this would be a three-star series for me. I thought it would be easy, fun, and light, but I didn't think that I would be that emotionally moved or feel that connected to the characters because it's a YA romance graphic novel series. I didn't think it was for me. This is for everybody. The end. This is originally an online webcomic that got published into a graphic novel and is now a series on Netflix. They did such a great job with the casting and it's so cute. Just as a side note, this is about two boys named Nick and Charlie and how they met, became friends, and fell in love. This series also has remedied all my gripes that I had with the romance genre. There's communication, there's stakes, the characters are complete people with families, interests, and friends, and every character outside of Nick and Charlie were just as interesting and fun to read about. The dialogue was so realistic. This is exactly how teenagers talk. And it was so well done that it made me feel like I was in high school with them. It didn't make me feel othered or that I was too old to be reading the story. I was so impressed with it. I think it handled the complicated nature of coming out or coming to terms with your sexuality so well. There was trans representation. There was great themes about mental illness and, and how little power the other person and the relationship has over such a big complexity. This is a comfort series. I cannot wait for the fifth one to come out. Thank you to everyone who let me know that I could read them online. Chef's kiss. I gave one, three, and four, four stars, and the second one, five stars. That was my absolute favorite and made me tear up. This is a top tier series. Definitely read it if you want to read it. And the 18th book I read was The Housekeeper and the Professor by Ogawa. This is a very short and poetic literary contemporary that follows a housekeeper who just gets hired to take care of this mathematician who only remembers math and everything that happened before 1975, but his short-term memory only lasts 80 minutes. And so it shows us the relationship that the housekeeper forms with this professor and also the relationship that the professor forms with her son Root, who he names Root because his hair looks like the symbol. It really has you wondering what it means to be a person if you don't have your memories. Who are you if you don't have your memories? How do you form relationships if you don't remember the people around you? But it definitely showed that it's possible, which was so touching. The only reason that this book got four stars instead of five is because there was a little too much baseball talk for me. Any book that has sports that consume a lot of its pages definitely loses me a little bit. I even hate math, but I think they did such a beautiful job with it. The first first chapter, ah, oh, made my heart sing. I think the author did such a good job handling the numbers, but the sports, eh. But aside from that, so beautifully written, so well done. Four stars, four stars, four stars. And that's it, those are the 18 books I read last month. I do not think I will ever read this much again, or not for a hot minute. I would really love to hear your recommendations on paranormal horror that doesn't have cultural appropriation, which Lucy Foley book was your favorite, or honestly, just any recommendation at all. I love talking about books. I love reading all the comments about books. This is my happy place. Thank you so much for Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. Remember, you can get your first book for Book of the Month for $9.99 using the code Allison Pages, link below. Friendly reminder that there are only a few days left to pre-order the Cowboy Cats crew deck, also link down below. Thank you so much to everyone on Patreon who makes it possible for me to upload every single week. I hope you're happy, and as always, thank you for clicking, thank you for caring, and thank you for being nice. I'll see you in the next one. Bye!